Uh, welcome to the First Congregational Church in Palo Alto, an open and permanent congregation of the United Church of Christ. My name is Stephen Ketchum. I'm the co-chair of the Peace and Justice Task Force. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome, welcome you here this evening to this conversation between John Markov and Jerry Kaplan on the ethics of artificial intelligence. So it seems that artificial intelligence or AI is in the, the news all the time now, and many of these stories do have an ethical component to them. So you hear about students who might be cheating using ChatGPT on their papers, or we hear about the screenwriters who are concerned that they're losing their jobs, or the core that their ideas are being incorporated in, in the uh, training models that the lang large language models are learning from in their the ideas of the And in the ways we see that AI can be used in combat, in warfare, in drone warfare. And there's the threat of, of no human liberty and um, an attack drone. Or we also see the economic effects of the concentration of power and weapon that comes through all of this uh, technology of artificial intelligence. So we're really thrilled to have two experts here this evening. Um, John Markov uh, here is um, <laughs> so with the National Writer over the New York Times and the Technology Front. He joined the paper in March of 1988 uh, and has had more than 2,000 by months and really Pulitzer Prize in 2013 on the subject of labor and domination. So he is a tonight as well. Um, he retired in 2017 to write a book, uh, Whole Earth, The Living Lives of Stuart Brand, and that was his sixth book, including um, What the Dormans Said, which is uh, how the 60s counterculture influenced the uh, personal computer industry and uh, with others as well. <laughs> so, um, and uh, we're delighted that when we proposed this uh, evening to have him speak, he suggested that uh, he not only share his perspective, but then by along with Jerry Catholic, uh, who is a widely known expert in the fields of artificial intelligence. He's a serial entrepreneur, a technology innovator an educator, and a futurist. <laughs> uh, he's going to start with companies, including two that have gone public, and his, uh, some of the foundational technologies that he's been involved with are talent computing, uh, talent and pen computing, and uh, online auctions, or his company on sale was uh, launched five months before eBay and also um, electronic digital instruments. So um, he is also an author of the best-selling book, Startup, Silicon Valley Adventure, which uh, tells this story of the family of Go Computer. And he is currently an adjunct lecturer at Stanford, where he uh, teaches on the topics, um, the social and economic impact of artificial intelligence. So we do have some great speakers. Um, we also have distributed uh, index cards on your chair. So uh, we'll come through in about 20 minutes. If you have any questions for speakers, uh, please write them here and we'll collect this uh, at uh, you know, probably about uh, 8 o'clock and pass them up to, to John for uh, inclusion into the, the dialogue. And uh, I will also note that we're continuing a follow up session on the ethics of AI on October 1st. Uh, which will focus more on the Christian kind of uh, So if you're interested in catching that So uh, without further ado, thank you. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'll start off. Uh, Jerry and I have been doing this uh, publicly and privately for at least a decade. Um, we each wrote a, a book about AI and uh, robotics in, uh, I guess, 2014, 2015. And actually, we go all, sort of all the way back. I think Joe, Jerry arrived in, in the Bay Area in 1981, roughly, as, as a postdoc at Stanford. 78, 79. 79. And I, I started as a reporter in 81. And um, 
the AI industry. I mean, Jerry was involved actually in two of the first commercial AI companies um, that were here. Symantec, you may not know, originally began as an artificial intelligence company and then turned into a computer security company much later on. And technology, I think you might remember, it was on University Avenue at one point, an interesting company. But those companies all fell um, afoul of what became known as the AI winter. And so Jerry went on to do other things, but he's come back to the field more recently. Um, uh, so I thought we could start, I, will, I want to start, um, since we want to talk about religion and technology and ethics in that context a little bit. I have a very short story to read. It's only 11 paragraphs, so it won't go on very long. But I, and, and some of you may have run across this, but it's, it's long been a favorite of mine. I, I, was almost, I, I grew up in Palo Alto. I checked out my first book from the... Uh, College Terrace Library in fourth grade. It was called The Green Ant from Mars. And for the next decade or so, I read nothing but science fiction. And along the way, I stumbled across this story and it stuck with me. And so I thought it would be a nice way to, to get things going. Uh, it's called The Answer. It was written by Frederick Brown in 1954. Um, and it goes like this uh, Doryev ceremoniously soldered the final connection with gold. The eyes of a dozen television cameras watched him and the sub-ether bore through the universe a dozen pictures of what he was doing. He straightened and nodded to Dwar Rain, then moved to a position besides the switch that would complete the contact when he threw it. The switch that would connect all at once all of the monster computing machines of all the populated planets in the universe, 96 billion planets, into the super circuit that would connect them all into one super calculator, one cybernetics machine that would combine all the knowledge of all the galaxies. Dwar Rain spoke briefly to the watching and listening trillions. Then, after a moment's silence, he said, Now, Dwaryev. Dwaryev threw the switch. There was a mighty hum. The surge of power from 96 billion planets. Lights flashed and quieted along the miles-long panel. Dwaryev stepped back and threw, drew a deep breath. The honor of asking the first question is yours, Dwar Rain. Thank you, said Dwar Rain. It shall be the question that no single cybernetics machine has been able to answer. He turned to face the machine. Is there a God? The mighty voice answered without hesitation, without clicking of a single relay. Yes, now there is a God. <laughs> Sudden fear flashed on the face of Doryev. He leaped to grab the switch. A bolt of lightning from the cloudless sky struck him down and fused the switch shut. <laughs> so that's stuck with me. <laughs> and you know, actually, I mean, Jerry can answer this, but um, you know, I would commend to you who are interested in the sort of the connection between uh, religion and, and technology and AI. Um, a, a book by Robert Jurassic. It's a decade old, but um, it, it's called. Um, AI, Visions of Heaven and Robotics, Artificial Intelligence, Virtual Reality. It was written in 2012. And it, it really is, it, it deals with a lot of the kind of stuff that we run across all the time in Silicon Valley. And he noticed a, a, a decade ago that there were a generation of uh, technologists who all had this kind of, I mean, it was almost Christian, except they were technological in their outlook, but they're sense was that the world in the first half of the 21st century would be populated by intelligent machines. And then the, the corollary was that we as a species would be gone at the end of that century. And it's, it's really a fun book. Uh, and, and nothing has slowed down in terms of that discussion since then. So but, but um, going back to the story, uh, the answer, your thoughts about, uh, about uh, this notion of uh, you know, super powerful machines and, and uh, um, the notion of a deity. I mean, uh, well, actually, I, so do you, do you have any, I, I have a thought, but do you have a reaction to the? Well, I'm pretty agnostic about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that, uh, what I think the audience would be benefit from hearing is, it's a wonderful story, but it is, this is absolutely outside of reality uh, in several respects. First of all, if you had 96 billion planets, you couldn't communicate in real time. So let's just start with that. But the idea that... Unless you had access to some, some space in today's communication. Right? Well, you know, you want to... That's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, 
I, this is not a realistic query. It's not something we need to be concerned about. And it's a distraction from the real issues which uh, were mentioned that need immediate attention uh, with respect to the regulating and uh, uh, dealing with the potential uh, side effects and issues of the current generation of artificial intelligence. But uh, so th this, this takes me to sort of where I wanted to get started because um, I think in many ways this is about us as a species and a society and rather than being about the machines that we're design, de de designing. I mean, one of the things, in, in 2014, 2015, I was working on this book called Machines of Loving Grace, and I be began to realize that there were a set of technologists, people like Jerry, um, who had gone into the field of AI based on something that they'd seen or read in science fiction. Absolutely. Um, in Jerry's case, and in the case of Rod Brooks, who was um, an important, uh, he was trained at Stanford, and they went on to, to um, uh, be a, a head of the MIT uh, AI lab, and, and he, he started the company that gave us Roomba. Um, they both went into the field after seeing um, Space Odyssey. Now, now, I saw that movie too, but I did not think that I was going to design HAL, but for some reason that, that captured me. What, what, what it, how did it affect you? Um, well, listen, how many people here have seen, but I've always done this. This is alone an interesting sociological <laughs> thing. Uh, if, if the, I, here's what I discovered from teaching at Stanford. Anybody who's under the age of 40, if you ask them this question, never heard. It. Just, never. So I stopped using the picture, you know, the red, the red eye and all that. Hal 9000 was the name. Yeah. The but over 40, of course, it's a classic. Everybody's seen it. I don't know why. I hope it comes comes back. Yeah. Um, well, it, it's just it was very inspiring. The, the computer might be like that. And the interesting thing, <laughs> if I can fast forward a little bit, um, is uh, we are. I'm not a hypester about AI. You know this. I'm mostly like, calm down. It's just a tool. You know, these are these applications. All the stuff you hear about. Oh my God, it's you know, terrible. It's uh, uh, not really true. But uh, the Hell 9000 is practical today, and probably in the next, I'd I say today, a year or two, uh, we will have systems of that nature and power, and we do have to worry about what happened in the film, which is an interesting story, which we'll see. Uh, well, so to, let's, let's start there. So okay. it gets to the point of where are we and how quickly are we moving forward? Mm -hmm. um, and that, if we're moving very quickly, some of, the, of these ethical concerns are immediate. Yeah. If, if we're doing what we usually do, which is um, sort of succumb to Silicon Valley's hype, right. and then we maybe have some more time to think about things. I mean, it's striking to see how uh, Silicon Valley has mobilized the governments of the world right now. Almost every government is now thinking about their AI regulatory framework that they're going to create. Well, that's because of this. there's been this toxic brew of the people that uh, Jurassic was talking about. The, uh, techno uh, nerds, yeah. uh, the optimists, uh, uh, the uh, what are they called, John? The uh, uh, you mean tra transhumanists yeah. and, and uh, people who believe in uh, the well, singularity and all that. And, and there's, there's no scientific basis for that. It's primarily a religious concept. That's what's so fascinating about it. It mirrors exactly what happened with the uh, mystics in the first century of Christ Christian. Christianity. We could go on about that, but that's a whole different lecture. I might be interested in this crowd. Um, but your question was uh, different. It was about, uh, sorry. No, no, so I mean, I'm, 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 I'm trying to get a framing of, oh, of how we're okay. Yeah. okay. Well, first of all, I'm, not, I'm the last guy who's going to say, oh my God, this is like totally going to be amazing and different and it's happening very quickly. And as you know, I started to write a book expecting to explain this technology of, of generative artificial intelligence, which is the new wave of AI. And when I got into it, I came to the exact opposite conclusion. We are on the edge of a really important transition in human history. And I can explain that. A bit. We, we may have a different view of what the transition is. Why, why don't you, and then I'll... Well, the, the, the long and the short of it is, we've created a device which is intelligent. And lots of people are going to argue about that. What do you mean? And is it conscious? It's not conscious. It's not going to take over the world. There's no desires or needs or wants. It's not trying to wipe us out or anything. But, but I saw you also use the word intelligence. But you also recently, at another public event, called it a general intelligence. That's where we may, we may quibble. Well, OK. Let's quibble. <laughs> um, 
the previous waves of AI, all or most of the applications targeted that, excuse me, they were targeted at specific applications. So you have a program that's very good at recognizing faces. We have a program that can help diagnose uh, skin cancer. We have a program that can translate from A to B. And it was pretty well understood how those architectures worked and what they were. An interesting thing happened about a year and a half ago. It was fairly sudden. And I think it's worth explaining, but let me give you the conclusion first. They changed that. And you now have systems that are very general in nature. You can talk to them about anything. And they will give you thoughtful and careful responses based upon having learned a great deal from a wide variety of sources. OK. And so you have a different, a different definition of general than I thought was meant. Yeah. OK, so um, I may be wrong, but my sense is that you take the world's best chess pipe right. program, and you change one rule in chess. You get the bishops, rather than moving diagonally, to move uh, horizontally. My understanding is that program will fall off a cliff, while yeah. a 12-year-old will do just fine with that new rule. Now, to me, that, that would be necessary to be a truly general intelligence. Okay. I think here's the, uh, I'm not saying you're wrong. I, this is a different point of view. If you took a 12-year-old and said, play chess, they're not going to do a very good job. Same thing is true with these new devices. Uh, that's, there, there are two things that people expect from computers that are just about to be blown completely out of the water. And the first of them is that if, you've, if, it, if it reads something, which was mentioned in your introduction, you know, if it, if it collects all this stuff, that it's somehow stored inside the program. And it can regurgitate this exactly and precisely, because that's what we expect computers to do. You store information, and you know, it, it can be combined in some way, but it's regurgitated and it exists inside that computer program in some way. That's not what these things are and what they do. They're much more like human beings. They get exposed to different things, and they kind of develop a, an, a best way I can describe it is an intuitive sense of what things are. And they have faulty memory, and they don't can't, they can solve some kinds of problems, and others they have trouble with. And they make mistakes, and they uh, uh, say things that aren't, aren't true. Uh, that's, that's the, uh, you know, the, the main. So, so, but how far do they go toward being reasoning systems? Emily, good em question. Emily Bender, who's a linguist at University of Washington, referred to these models that statistically sort of work on the basis of a very large data set as being stochastic curves. Now, are they more than... It was Tim, wasn't it? No, it, well, they were, both, they were both on that paper. Okay. Bender and Tim did it. Yeah. Um, I, are I, they more than stochastic curves? Absolutely. I think that is one of the greatest disservices to this technology. I can only assume that they don't fully understand what, why this is important and what happened and why it's different. And I can go through that, but okay. try to do it yeah. very briefly. Yeah. But yes, you hear this thing, ah, it's nothing but predicting the next word. Well, what am I doing? Is my brain predicting the next word? Of course it is. If I play jazz piano, uh, you know, am I predicting the next key? Of course I'm predicting the next key. It's a, it's a mistake that it misleads people into what's really happening. Now, an actual description of what's going on inside these generative AI programs, the ones I'm, you're talking about, to be clear, the LLMs, the large language models. There are other ones for vision and a few other things. But what's really going on is um, it, it takes what you say and it, it compiles that into a, it down into a form which I think I can make a good case represents an approximation of the meaning of what you said. It then looks into its head. <laughs> I'm sorry to use the term, but you know, it's memory, it's it, what it's learned, it's, it's structure. And it figures out, well, given where that is, this is what probably I should say next. So it formulates what to say next, and then it translates that back into words. Yeah. Now, that's a pretty good description to me of general intelligence. You're interpreting what somebody says in the, in the, in the context of all of your knowledge. You, uh, figure out what you want to say, and then you go and say it. And that's what's, that's what's going on. So this has been framed. The, the debate may have moved on, but a number of months ago, there were, there were Microsoft researchers uh, released a paper called, it was known as the Sparks of AGI paper, right. arguing that they were seeing things that, exactly. that, that suggested. A group of research at Stanford responded saying, hey, everything you're seeing could be, could, could be uh, generated by a statistical process. You're not seeing 
intelligence. You're anthropomorphizing these machines. Well, but to me, this reminds me of the, uh, it's an old joke about the uh, uh, English PhD student who writes a thesis, and his, his uh, thesis, uh, the idea in his thesis was, he has proved that Shakespeare's plays were not written by Shakespeare. Instead, they were written by somebody else with the same name. <laughs> <laughs> of course you could do this statistically. I mean, that's exactly, well, how do you know? That's a perfectly reasonable description, but that's not, Yeah. It, it, this is way deeper, this is way deeper, and you know it. Well, so let you, me, <laughs> let me you, you interact with these things. We agree, but for, in a way for different reasons. I, I, what I find significant. Well, we can argue about anything we agree on. I think this is apocal, um, and, and it's of the same significance you're, you're suggesting, but for different reasons. Okay. And what, what I've seen, so I've been around long enough to see a number of generations in computing, uh, going back to mainframe computers. And mainframe computers touched a very small portion of the world's population, basically military and corporate workers. Every generation after that has touched a broader percentage of the world's population with this computational fabric that we're build, building. So with the advent of the smartphone in the, in the past couple of years, we reached half of the population of the world. What's significant about this advance is about language and interface, and that with this technology, this technological generation and shift, we will be at ubiquity. We will reach the entire human population group, for good or ill. But clearly, we're, we're now in a different, a different place than we were like five years ago. Well, the ubiquity is a very interesting point. But you could also say, hey, Taylor Swift has probably reached the ubiquity. You know? <laughs> so to me, that's not the essence of it. The essence of it is ubiquity with what? And this is something that's going to be incredibly powerful and useful for that ubiquitous thing. Well, let's talk about the usefulness. I have seven of these on my phone, and I interact with them a lot now. Really? It's really quite a fascinating period. Connect them to each other and see what they talk about. <laughs> well, I, I should get them to, pro yeah, that, that is, people are doing that. That is uh, happening. Everything that could be yeah, happening is, is, is happening, as you know. Right? But, but I feel like Ronald Reagan at this point. It's trust but verify. I don't trust these things as of far course. as I can toss them. 12-year-old kid, you talk, you know, Hey, is the sky blue? I don't know, it's green to me. That's exactly right. You can't, you can't trust them. That was the issue in 2001, if you may recall. In the plot, they decided they had to shut down the HAL 9000 because it had made a mistake. They were so astonished that a computer had made a mistake that they felt it had to be shut down. That was the fulcrum of the plot. Computers make, you all interact with computers, for God's sake, they make mistakes all the time, it's horrible. Uh, you know, but the, the point is, you're interacting with something that has a different set of characteristics. Uh, something that I, I really want to write about. You know, I, I, I like to, I have a term for this, they were videoing me, I don't want to, I don't, please don't steal my ideas. And, uh, it's non-human nature. What is this thing like? And it's not like other computer programs. And it's going to change the way we conceive of what a computer is, what it can do. But it's also going to violate some expectations that we have. Yeah. And that's where it's going. Well, so I want to nudge us slightly toward ethics. Because we can talk about performance and what they're capable of, but clearly this is going to be part of our world. One of my reservations, uh, and let me sort of move not quite to religion, but to Martin Buber, who was you know, a sort of an important humanist. Buber had these, these two ways of, of, of conceiving relationships. There was I and thou, which is the face-to-face -face relationship that, that we, we have as human beings. But he also talked about I and it, which is our, our relationship with inanimate objects. And I think because of the way this technology is evolving, we're coming to this new kind of relationship, which is I, it, thou. That most of our interactions in the world at a certain point, particularly in COVID, when you know, everything was mediated by Zoom, is, is mediated by a comp computational fabric where there's some algorithm or some language model or something in between us that, to me, I mean, the dark side of this, if I can go down the science fiction road, road is the Star Trek um, metaphor of the board. You know, resistance is futile. You will be assim assimilated. And I think this is happening at a very rapid pace. That, that uh, you know, face-to-face -face interactions, for whatever reason, are becoming less common, and computer-mediated interactions are becoming more common. So, then these things become part of our 
you know, they become a, a quintessential part. This has already happened, right? Yeah. Ethan? Um, well, first of all, that's a brilliant way to put it, I have to say. I really I want to talk to you more about it. You're absolutely right. It's, it's not I am thou. It's, uh, it's I it thou, yeah. you know, in some sense. Uh, but you're also touching on something that Marshall McLuhan, if I remember, uh, his great insight was that the medium is the message. And because everything that we're saying, or a lot of the interactions we're having today is mediated by computer, it colors what we can say, how it's taken, and what it means. And uh, that's, this is being an extension of that. Uh, we're going to be in a world where a lot of the interactions that you're going to have are with your own personal assistant on your phone, whichever one of the seven wins your, wins your, your race here. <clears throat> and that's going to be arranging meetings and doing things for you and talking on your behalf. It's going to be representing you to the rest of the world. Now, it's not going to tell you what to do, board like. You know, you're not, it's not one mind, but, it, you know, it will, it will say, well, I think that uh, John's busy on Friday and he's not likely to want, he doesn't like to do that, this kind of thing on Friday because he wants to spend time with his wife. Well, you know, when you do this, his wife has to come here. Uh, so, uh, so it, it's true that it will color things and change the, somehow in ways that we can't really understand yet, uh, the nature of human interaction. So the real question is, when it interposes like that, is it acting as a filter or a, a uh, uh, somehow coloring it? Or is it acting as a, uh, as like a piece of glass? It's, it's helping us to, to see better. Is it helping us to, to see the world better or is it, is it disconnecting us from that? World? And the step toward ethics, are these things, do we need to treat these things the way we treat humans? Not at all. Are they, are they autonomous? If they were autonomous, would we? No. Uh, these are machines. These are software running on a computer. That's the problem. It has been presented uh, in, because of the interfaces. These things are designed to talk as if they had a mind. And that's a great way to interact with something. But it's not thinking. It's not... But is that a design thought? I mean, to yeah, not... I think so. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a design decision. It was a great idea. And it works because you can seem to, you know, when you're interacting with some of these LLMs, you're not really talking uh, to an intelligent thing. What you're doing is you're talking to the accumulated wisdom of mankind boiled down into this form. And a lot of the ways in which it interacts, that, after these things are trained, they're put through a, a process of socialization. That's the best way to describe it. It's like they're sent to finishing school. And it's this whole elaborate process of interacting with people. And all these examples have been collected. You're allowed to say this. It's rude to say that. Here's how you should react. This is what you should do. It's just like going to finishing school. And that's what you're interacting with. And the main difference you're seeing in the seven that you talk to is some are a little more friendly and some of them are taught never to say this or that, you know. Well, they, you can clearly see they have different uh, knowledge bases. That's one of the first things you see if you ask the same question all seven of them. They, <coughs> well, so they were probably trained with very similar data. But if you look at it this way, it's sort of like if you have an audience here and they're going to watch a movie, ask each of them, what's the movie about? You're going to get different answers. Yeah. Because that gets interpreted in the context of the other things that they know. What about the question of autonomy? If you see sparks of AGI, do you see sparks of autonomous behavior? Well, I guess I need a little more better understanding of what you mean by autonomy to uh, Well, so when you talk about making these things trustable or trustworthy, um, and they're touching the internet. Let's say you know they're connected to the internet, and they can do arbitrary things. Yes, that's um, are they going to run off the, the reservation and do things that are in there? And this is this, well, there's the paper clip problem, and then there's the issue of there's rogue behavior. Right. There's there's a bunch of different paper clip problem is you tell it to make paper clips, and it ends up destroying the human race while it's trying to make paper clips because it doesn't have a, a good moral framework. Okay. Why don't we take that issue first? This is the uh, 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 runaway superintelligence issue. Uh, that particular example comes from Nick Bostrom at Oxford. And uh, I've talked to him about this. And uh, I, I think it's nonsense. <laughs> He's not here. Uh, the, the reason is it assumes a couple of things that are not true, which is that assumes that we can't control this stuff. Uh, let me go back to the Hell 9000 to illustrate this for the audience. Suppose the right way to deal with that problem, excuse me, let me give you the rest of the plot was the computer decided to kill the crew. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And it did that because it was programmed to make sure that nothing interfered with the mission. And when they, if they were going to shut the computer down, that was going to interfere with the mission. That's essentially the paperclip argument in a microcosm. Okay, so what's the answer? It's incredibly simple. You tell the you program the computer, or in this case, you literally just tell the computer, you're not supposed to kill people. That's a very bad thing. Well, and which takes us back to Asimov's three laws. Mm -hmm. Can well, you? Do we need to? So we go through the no. You, you, a, you know, a robot may not injure a human uh, being or through inaction allow a human being to be injured. That's one. Right. Two, a robot must obey orders given it to it by humans except when such orders would conflict with the first law. And law three is a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. Yeah. Three very simple laws. Is well, that in principle, but if you remember what actually Asimov wrote about that, his point was that doesn't work. <laughs> and he wrote a series of stories very clever, explaining why those three things don't really work. And uh, that's true yeah. uh, that, that that's the case. But it is tr true that you can program these things when the process of socialization, just as you teach kids, it's a, it's a sin to murder. You know, you, it's against the law, it's wrong, it's immoral, and you shouldn't do it. Uh, that's what you do with the machine. What do you, th I mean, so you're, Al Alice Gopnik, who's a psychologist at Berkeley, has, and Ted Chang, actually, a science fiction writer, is also, I think, a physicist, have argued that we should train our AIs the way parents raise children. Yes, absolutely. Uh, is that practical at this point? Yeah. yeah. I don't see why not. I, I, you, you don't take it too literally. But that's what the process is very much about. Um, it's, it, it's human feedback. It's examples that are given. Uh, it's, a, it's a set of... It's a finishing school, and that's what you said. They're going to make mistakes. They will kill humans occasionally. Uh, and, and the thing about killing humans, uh, just to make this clear, it's, a, it's, it's wrong to murder people and to kill people, except when it's not. And there are plenty of circumstances in which that's considered acceptable behavior. And we have a lot of that going on right now. And it's our money, our tax dollars are causing it. When, there's also the issue of geopolitical competition. Yes. So let's say we build a good regulatory structure for controlling our AIs, and China, Russia, and whoever else have very different models. I mean, I just noticed, I, I saw something recently that the Chinese Communist Party has decreed that all of their language models must, must be politically correct. Right, no, I, and my I reaction to that. Good luck with that. That's, <laughs> that's exactly what I was just out there. Good luck with that. That is not going to, that, you want to, you want to retard me. I don't get it. <laughs> Why? Why good luck? Well, because of the nature of the, the, the nature of these systems, they're not programmed. Uh, it's, it's, it's going to be very hard because that's a very vague concept. And uh, what's it supposed to do if you ask it for some fact that they regard as against the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, the public you know, good? Uh, it's a great idea. It's a great thing to aspire to. But it went further. I mean, I've read, I read the translation of the law. And, you know, the problem is you, you put that program together, you're responsible if, if it, for everything that it does. And this is a real issue that we're going to have to deal with. Because, um, uh, how can I put this? The, uh, today, the way, the way we should be regarding these is a little bit more like the way we regard an animal or a dog. You know, you can train a dog, and you can control it. You say it has to be on its leash. But dogs will bite people once in a while. And we don't worry about that when we're walking around the street here in Palo Alto much. You know, coming to a leash, walking the dog. You know, the dog's going to bite you. Uh, but it does happen. And there's a whole legal theory around this. And interestingly enough, it's called first bite theory. And I'm not making this up. Uh, if, the dog, if my dog bites you, and, uh, you know, it was the first time, and I'm acting in a reasonable, responsible way. I'm not liable for that. But if I'm unnoticed that that dog has done that, and it does it again, now I've got a problem. And there was a woman here in San Francisco, whose name escapes me. It was a lacrosse. Uh, yeah. Uh, she was and their neighbor's dog killed her yeah. in the hallway. And uh, that woman went to jail because they had already been unnoticed that the dog was dangerous. Yeah. So it's the same thing here. Let's talk a little bit about the community that's developing this technology. Um, 
So, uh, you know, there's this model that is cited frequently uh, from the biotechnology world, where at a certain point during the 1970s, the biotechnology community came together at a CLMR, um, and they basically paused research where they thought about the impact of their technology. Now, I, I reported on the computer industry's efforts to try to emulate um, the biotech community, beginning in 2009, that was their first meeting in, in, uh, in a seal mark. And I've watched with kind of incredulity as they have had event after event after event talking about pausing and nobody's paused. Nobody's, nobody's paused at all. They're all. They paused all the way to the bank, literally. <laughs> and and it, it, you know, Elon Musk called for a big pause and then he founded an AI company, for God's sakes. I mean, it's, it's really quite remarkable. And they, you know, they, they've engaged with the government, the, the leaders of the AI community just went to Washington um, and had a private meeting and not a public meeting, which was interesting why, why it should be private if, if, if transparency is important. Well, what kind of marks do you give the community um, for it? Uh, unfortunately, this is a real free-for-all, and it's a very strange thing that, that's going on right now. And the reason is nobody's really sure. This is so new and so different that nobody's really sure where it's going. And there are real legitimate concerns. And some things that are near-term problems that are fairly obvious that it's going to cause, and we need to address those. But those are just around the edges of what, what's happening with this technology. Biotechnology, it was obvious how dangerous it was and what would happen if it got into the, we used it the wrong way. And that's why they did what they did. And everybody said, no, we're not going to do this because it was clear. Now, if it was clear that these systems were somehow going to start, I don't know, <laughs> manufacturing guns on their own and killing people, turning them into the Terminator, here they come. The <laughs> bolt from heaven, the <laughs> switch. Uh, the, uh, the, you're being sick. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, sorry to ask questions. If, um, where was I? If, they, uh, if it was clear what the effects were going to be, there wouldn't be all this discussion, and it, there would, people would be taking it much more seriously inside the industry now. But as you can see, there's a lot of disagreement. Some people think these are just stochastic parrots. I don't. I think we've created something really important and different, and it says a lot about who we are, how we uh, operate, and uh, it's going to change the future of humanity. You know, there's a, it's such a, uh, earlier this year, OpenAI, which is one of the key players in this field, uh, published a report, and uh, I just read some of the reporting and didn't really pay much attention to the report. What the reporting suggested was that OpenAI had uh, let their uh, program loose and it actually uh, used a task rabbit human worker. I wrote all about this, yeah. But it wasn't true, right? What? So the, what, yeah, it wasn't true. I went and read the report. Okay. Um, so the, the report, so what, what came out in the press was they used a task rabbit human worker to circumvent a CAPTCHA, and they lied to it, which was a really classic moral thing. When you go and re read the report, that these people, there were four, four reports on this. They, that never happened. Well, what it was it was there as an example that people in the safety committee were testing and it wasn't capable of doing any of this. Oh, they had it, they had it contained. No, it didn't do it. It wasn't contained. It couldn't do it. Uh, I, I've got the report here. I can show it to you. I better read it. <laughs> All <laughs> the reporters got wrong. They had, it was a terrible presentation, but when you read what happened, well, they, they had this set of things that might happen, including lying to a human in order to accomplish right. something. Right. None of that ever happened. That was a hypothetical in a report. I've got to read that. Stop the presses on my book, because uh, I've read, I read it okay, extensively, well, but I haven't read the original source, it, which is a mistake, and I should always read the original, so, um, the original source. Let's, That's why I stick to the Bible when it comes to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, this one final uh, point, I started to ask about geopolitical competition, and different cultures may treat these things differently. I think that people probably don't know a lot about the Chinese experience. I mean, this actually first happened in China. Um, these were deployed first. A program called Zhao Ice in China, beginning in 2014, was dis deployed by Microsoft. And the impact it had within Chinese culture is remarkable. It is still being run in China uh, as a software service. Um, at this point, they've had 660 million people interact with this. Um, some of these may be duplicate, but these are accounts. The average length of a chat, chat session 
um, is 27 interactions, so the conversations are long. When, at the point I first reported about it, 25% of the largely young Chinese audience had uh, written I love you to it. Um, they called it toilet time because the kids would go into the bathroom and have these conversations late at night. So they deployed this in China, and it, it had a very her-like, if you've seen the movie, kind of outcome. Then they deployed it kind of quietly in America, a program called TAG. And it instantly became a, misog a misogynistic, sadistic, racist. <laughs> and so I just, and it says a lot about the differences between the two cultures, I think. Well, it also has to do with what it was trained on. But, but you're touching on one of the issues that I think is going to be very important and we are going to have to deal with. And that is, if we have these systems that are helping to raise our children, that are acting as tutors in schools, these are already available online, um, they're trusted, they're uh, regarded as objective, they're considered authoritative, I mean, they're, put, they're being treated as authority figures in those kinds of settings. How can we not expect them, people not to form emotional attachments? Now, lots of people have emotional attachments to uh, inanimate objects. Uh, you know, some people fall in love with their car, you know, or a doll, or, you know, a video game, or something like that. But um, this is on a whole different level. And this is uh, what I, in my writing, I've called this emotional pornography. Because what you're really doing is, you're, it's like the, the love of the field the dog gives you, these things will be able to do that at, a, at a, a much higher level. And when they do that, I don't see how you cannot help but you're going to have to fight the tendency to form an emotional connection with it. Yeah. Uh, people who are lonely, people who uh, just feel like other people don't respect them, it would be great. You come home, you sit down, and you talk to your thing. And, oh, this is what happened. This guy messed with me today, and I had a rotten day at the job, and my boss was like, oh, that's so terrible. He's such a jerk. And, you know, it's going to be but very sympathetic. I'm, I'm, I've been struggling with this for a, for a long time. Let me put, let's put this in context. One of the sort of, growing up in Palo Alto, one of the things that was sort of etched into my mind, I was, I was working as a substitute paper boy uh, and delivering papers in... in That's how I got you starting those papers. <laughs> I did. I did go on that. And Professor Bill. And I walked into an assisted living facility. And it was, it would traumatize me to this day. There were 30 people who were aged who were parked in front of a television in the day. And I realized that said a lot about the way we care with people in, 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 who are aging. And I'm, I'm going to try to link this together. In terms of, we haven't talked about the impact on 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 um, unemployment, but I was in 2012 to 2014. I was a big believer in the uh, the employment impact of this technology, and then uh, I was making the case to Danny Kahneman uh, that this technology was going to come to China and it was going to lead to mass unemployment and social disruption. And he stopped me. He said, "You don't get it." He said, "In China, we'll be lucky if the robots come just in time." And I said, well, what do you mean? And he walked me through the demographic transition that China is going through, gone through. And I realized that not only will there not be an adequate labor pool in China, there won't be enough people to care for the aging. They're facing it, we're facing it. And I changed the, you know, I was, a, I was reporting on this incident. At that point, I changed the question I was asking. I had been asking these technologists, when will there be self-driving cars? And after I talked to Kahneman, I began asking, when will there be robots that can safely give showers to aging humans? Harder problem. It's a problem that we're nowhere near solving. And um, so that, let me get, go all the way back. If we can have conversational machines, so there's a lot of evidence that if you keep people from being isolated, um, they, they, will, uh, they will age better. The, you know, all, dementia is set back and all that. What happens if, you, if we can't give people human contact, if we give them something that's substantive? Is that immoral? Is that, is that wrong? We're going to be able to do it shortly. Well, th this has been studied and written about extensively, uh, like Sherry Terkel at MIT. Um, and there's no definitive answer to this question. Uh, if you were that lonely person, and all of a sudden it made you comforted to be able to interact with the computer, it's doing something positive for you. But if it's doing that as a substitute for direct human interaction, it's also preventing you from really having uh, proper human connections. But we do this, children have dolls. You know, dolls talk sometimes. Children, uh, 
I'm sure you're well aware, become very emotionally attached to it. You're talking about Barbie at the moment, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't have Barbies, you know, G.I. Joe or something, you know, I wasn't emotionally attached. You didn't have a Ken doll in your gram? <laughs> no, I, I didn't. But, you know, the first thing you do with it, you just rip their clothes off and see what's going on. <laughs> uh, which, which was uh, quite a shock to me, actually. <laughs> um, that came up in the movie. Did it? I haven't seen the movie. Uh, sorry. I got to see Oppenheimer first. <laughs> They, they ripped their clothes off in Appleheim? <laughs> no. So let's, let's bring it to some of the questions. The, the, actually, this is one. Uh, the, if an MD acts on the basis of advice from the chatbot, who is liable for the result? Do we have an uh, MD? Okay. That's just yeah. The simple answer. Uh, if, if, the, if you're using tools, doctors make mistakes all the time. There's a well-designed legal and uh, practical system for holding people accountable if they have not acted in a reasonable way. And this is a tool. It's going to help doctors. And it's going to improve their performance dramatically. It will not always give them the correct answers, the correct advice, and they are responsible for it, just like you were saying. And checking that, making sure that they're doing the right thing. Uh, it, you have to make sure that they're interposed between the technology and the patient in order for them to have that... Uh, that responsibility. There's no question in my mind. The MD is responsible. Who else is responsible? The machines are responsible. You can't punish them. <laughs> Bad <ball. Yeah. laughs> I, this is one I think you've, you've uh, explored uh, also. Can you discuss the ethics and potential for an AI judicial system? Um, yes. Uh, well, the, every one of these questions, I'm tempted to get a half hour lecture, so <laughs> let, me, let me keep it short. Um, it's obviously a boon for, for lawyers in a number of different respects because it will reduce the uh, cost and the time to, uh, uh, for the most important in fact will be the you know, time and, and uh, cost of engaging in, in contracts, in documenting things into contracts. Uh, but that's not that exciting. You think about it in, in other forms of adversarial uh, law, uh, tort law or criminal law, um, lawyers will be able to use these systems very effectively for doing research, finding. They'll be like a, uh, a research assistant, a good paralegal. That's the way they will function. But the interesting thing is the next step, which is I think that we will develop a something akin to the small claims court, where uh, you will submit. It's a little bit like Judge Judy. You know, you agree to, to the form, and. <coughs> and you know, you, you talk to your little program and you tell it to argue your case. Yeah, your opponent talks to their, your opponent's not the correct word, your respondent or whatever, um, talks to their computer and, and develops a case. They will argue their case to another computer, which is the computer judge, and the judge will make a decision. And because this can happen instantly, you and I have a dispute, you can go to that system, it's going to be $10 each, we put our stuff in, and push the button, and you know, an hour later, we get back a carefully reasoned, uh, uh, which will have the force of law in that court. Uh, here's the way that I think that will work. Does it have the force of law? Probably not, but it's a little bit like uh, you know these plea bargaining situations uh, where you know this is the way I think this is going to come out. Now you and I can accept that, but we can appeal it. If we're going to appeal it, it's going to cost us money. We're on only. 2% of the things that get appealed from that system ever are done. And what happens is the regular court system becomes like the Court of Appeals. You don't go in and argue in the Court of Appeals. I don't know if people know that. That's not how it works. They review the, the record, and they either agree or disagree with uh, the decision. And so I think this is, uh, that's, I really think it would be fascinating. But we'll be able to adjudicate in a reasonably fair way uh, lots of uh, disputes that currently cannot be brought because there just aren't enough lawyers, it's too expensive, and people, um, uh, are, they, they can't deal with that. So they go get a gun and shoot their shoot the gun instead. You know? let, let me step back to the employment question. Um, you know, I said I had changed my mind about, I mean, generally about the question of computer automation, and I, I now feel that it's not going to be a problem. But, um, okay. but we haven't had this conversation since the rise of general, gener generative AI. Okay. Has that changed your mind at uh, all? No, not at all. Uh, in, in, let me, wait, you and I are kind of talking shorthand, so okay. there's some other people listening <laughs> in. Let me try, try to help. It, the question you always get asked is, 
what is this all going to mean for the future of jobs and employment? We're all going to be unemployed, and this computer's going to come and take our jobs. And the quick two-sentence answer is, these systems, the current AI and what it will be in the future, is a new wave of automation. And to understand what effect it's going to have on the economy and on jobs, you only have to go back and look at previous waves of automation. And all of these arguments were made with all of these previous technologies. Uh, sometimes it's specific to one industry, sometimes it's a bit more general. But the job markets are extremely resilient. And there will be plenty of jobs for people, particularly because of the demographics in our lifetime, which mine is short, but you know, some younger people here may be longer. Um, it's not going to be a, a, a factor. What it does is it changes the nature of work. It improves productivity, which means there's more money available. That money gets spent and uh, goes into people's pockets. And when they spend it, uh, that creates more demand and new kinds of jobs arise in order to uh, make that happen. So in short, I don't think it's going to be a problem. It causes short-term disruption, but uh, there will be plenty of jobs available for plenty of people. Um, let, let me just jump back to the legal question briefly. Do you have any sympathy for that poor New York attorney who had? I thought that was home there. GP, it was, so if you have an attorney who was under some pressure had GPT chat write his brief, and it, it cited many cases that it just imagined. Oh, imagine. <laughs> well, which is one of the most frightening things in the world to me. I mean, how can you trust anything? Because the sites look just yeah. wonderfully accurate. Well, he we, didn't bother to check any of them. Well, we need, I think we need to explain again for the audience. But this, this poor character, um, uh, you know, he, he was trying to, he had to get a brief into a court, and he used this thing to generate the brief, and he didn't really understand the technology or what its strengths or weaknesses were. And the nature of these things, we talk about the current generation, and this is going to change probably in the next two or three years, makes very persuasive, uh, clear, uh, strong statements which are complete, can be completely false. Now, is most of it false? No, most of it's amazing. But it, it, it just, it isn't designed yet right to know when it saying something that probably is not true. So one of the funniest things, John and I both tried this. Uh, they may have gotten me kicked off OpenAI, by the way. They literally banned me. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and, you know, if, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Sam Altman. If Sam Altman, if you're listening, will you reinstate my account to trust the service is down? Um, but the uh, first thing you do is you get in there for fun and you say, write my obituary. And it will say, you know, uh, John Markoff died on, you know, September 12th of uh, you know, 2020. And then it goes into all this other stuff. Obviously, he's the one asking the question. It must know that he's alive. Uh, but the point is, it, it does this very definitively. So it wrote this brief that it read beautifully. But the cases were all made up. And, you know, it, it was just for associating like, why this guy versus that guy, you know, this was the decision of the court. So he filed the damn thing, and he got, really got his poor guy. He got pilloried, and uh, he wasn't disbarred, but they, they had severe sanctions. So no lawyers will be doing that, I <laughs> Uh, cautionary tale. Actually, that, that is the first thing I did. Like most people, I asked um, ChatGPT about myself last October, and it noted that I had died in 2017. I, I was alarmed. I thought I could know John Markoff that I could see anywhere on the internet had died. But after a while, I realized I'd left the New York Times in 2017, which, of course, is probably more like <laughs> I, I argued with it for a couple of weeks, and it changed its mind. I have no idea why it changed its mind, but I think now. Can I tell a story? Too? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I have so many stories about interacting with these things that it just make your hair stand on end about the insight and intelligence and how helpful they have been. But um, now, <laughs> I'm just starting to blow well, my mind. It was a, uh, oh yeah, it was at the one at Google. Now Google had Bard. Bard, no, you're, you're up on all the Bard. It's not Google's current. Bard is Google's. Okay, so I get this invitation to try Bard. And it's integrated with web search. And back to one of the points you're making. Currently, these things are mostly just completely self-contained. But of course, what they're doing in a place like Google is they're trying to protect their monopoly uh, by uh, tell it to Ken Walker. Uh, <laughs> Uh, by uh, connecting it to search, so it can actually uh, go out and get some answers and formulate uh, a useful response, which it does reasonably well. So I asked it some questions, and it gave me an answer. 
And I knew the answer was wrong. And I said, uh, I don't think that's right. I'm pretty sure this is the answer. And he came back in the most polite way possible and said, oh, you're, you're absolutely right. I'm so sorry. I, I slipped my mind. I made some ridiculous comment. Like, you know, I, I, the funniest one I've seen like that is it said, oh, I must have made a typo. <laughs> it really happened, and I really saw it. Uh, it was on a video, actually, that on YouTube. You can track this way down. But I said, no, you're right. You're right. So I said, then I sat down and went, wait a minute. How did it know? How did it have that first answer? And when I corrected it, it knew that I was right. How is that possible? And so I asked it. And, and I said, how did you know that um, my answer was correct? Well, I said, after you asked me, after you complained about it, I went out and checked it on the web. And I found enough evidence, and I decided that you were right, and, you know, and, I, and I was wrong. So, of course, that raised the question, well, why did you do that in the first place? <laughs> and the answer, it took me 10 minutes of badgering this thing. I'm not kidding about this. And it was just squirming, like, well, you know, the AI doesn't always give you the right answer. And finally, I just kept narrowing down and nailed it down. And, I, and finally, I admitted it and said, well, it's just too expensive to go out and check the web hole because there's actually costs associated with that. And so it had been designed by Google to give you wrong answers rather than check them because that was too expensive. <laughs> Let me go through some of these because they're good questions here. So there. <laughs> um, this one's long, but I think this is this, this, this has got some history. Deep cut. But for those of us who weren't there in the 80s, how much of the fear of Chinese AI supercomputer and semiconductor progress reminds you of the fear of Japan and both the fifth generation project and America's response to MIDI in the form of Semitech? Is history repeating as tragedy or farce? <laughs> no, I, I think that's a very good point. But my point of view on this, which is is not definitive because I, I could easily be, be wrong in this. We are seeing the replay of exactly what went on, which is there's this kind of international fear uh, that, you know, my God, there's some kind of AI race, you know, the whole uh, Kai Fu Lee thing. Yeah. Uh, between the US and, you know, Europe, and everybody's up in arms. That's why there's all this regulation and we keep these chips away from those guys. Maybe they can't do it as fast, which was wrong. Yeah. Uh, and, um, the, the truth is, I don't think that's right. Software is the, uh, who was it that said the software wants to be free? Uh, Richard Stallman. Stallman. Stallman, thank you. You're Richard Stallman, right? <laughs> <laughs> you look like that. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, the, the, the point is that this is software technology. Uh, the people in China are just as good as the people here are doing this stuff already. Uh, and they're going to build their own systems, and they're going to have some relationships. Yeah. But there's no, there's no inter enduring international advantage as there could be for uh, several decades in uh, nuclear power. You could keep that a secret, you know, how to do that for a while. But that's not going to be the case here. No. So the truth this is this is going to be worldwide, everywhere, all the time. You can already follow uh, 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 YouTube instructions and put a, a pub, uh, open source language model on your own laptop computer, and you know basically have the entire uh, wealth of knowledge at, at, you know offline at your own disposal. Um, there's a wonderful book that was written by Neil Stevenson um, about um, uh, about. Uh, the plot is someone has to leave their child, they give them this very powerful computer as a tutor. And I have a friend who is doing that already. He's put a language model on a computer. He has an autistic daughter, and he's trying to help her learn to write, and he's given her this new kind of tool. I mean, it's a fascinating experiment, but it gives you a sense of how distributed this technology already is. I, I have read a little, not about probably this particular person, but it's one of the areas where it, it's one of those things you wouldn't have expected. It's very useful for helping to train autistic children because they, they can understand it and it can interact with them in, in a way that can understand them better than we can. Here's a good question that I don't have an answer to, maybe you do. Um, how do you perceive the influence of AI in the next presidential election? Oh, it's going to be terrible. <laughs> but it was already going to be terrible. It's just going to make it worse. Uh, there were already uh, a lot of people concerned about the uh, what are called deep fakes. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Um, there's so much this is just going to make the misinformation situation so bad 
that I actually have a, a suspicion that we're finally going to have to say, okay, uh, we've got to build a technology to control that technology, or we have to absolutely just prevent this from being used in certain kinds of forms. Now, that's going to be a tremendously difficult problem because of all of our history of uh, free speech. You know, why, why can't you do that? Why can't you say that? But it's going to reduce trust. It's going to make it very difficult to know. They used to say seeing is believing, and that's obviously not the case. Um, and so we're going to have to deal with this problem of misinformation, and we're just going to, it's just going to be a sewer of this stuff. I, it takes me back to uh, the problem with email spam, what came to be known as spam. And that, you may not know this, but you send emails to your friends and all that. 90% uh, of the email the average person gets is spam. And there's all these, there's a, an arms race between people trying to get that into your inbox and the institutions that are making these spam filters that are trying to get it out. And as you probably know, sometimes it picks up the wrong stuff and the message from your mother winds up in your spam folder and you don't know it. And they, you know, it's a problem. We're going to be running into exactly the same kind of thing. So it's my belief that we're going to have to build systems that are going to filter all of this nonsense for us and try to get rid of the really bad stuff. But that's going to take a decade. And for the next election, well, it, was, it was going to be a free-for-all anyway. It was going to be crazy. But uh, don't believe anything you read or see. These systems will also be able to target it in a very uh, specific way to each individual. And that's going to be really scary. So we've gone on for about an hour. Let's make this the, the, the last question. Um, uh, you've sort of gotten at this, uh, but I'll, I'll ask it again. Um, can, a, can AI be uh, uh, programmed or taught to, uh, be, con to be conscious? Can, will, will these machines be sentient? I'm, I'm in the middle of reading a bunch of papers on the subject. Right? The, the, the Bengio papers? <coughs> uh, so they're a group of 17 <laughs> philosophers. That's it. Yeah, um, um, they have, have got a framework for trying to decide. And they're, but they're using our theories of consciousness about that's biological right. systems to try that's to, correct. which may not be the right way to. <laughs> that's right. That, yes, good question. <laughs> um, we don't know what consciousness is. And there are a couple of prevailing, two major prevailing schools of thought is probably the best way to describe them in the philosophical community today about this. But all of a sudden, things that were just philosophers talking about this stuff and then going and having drinks is now, hey, you've got this object. Is this, does this meet any of the criteria that you've laid out? I have seen no compelling case made that these systems will be conscious in any normal sense. And part of that is, is I don't see how they can't experience things in the way that we do. And they don't have the biological basis for interpreting that, having feelings and all that kind of thing. So if you can't, if you can't have an experience, you can't, uh, you can't be conscious, in, in my opinion. Now, they're, right, they're applying these different frameworks. And, well, if it hits this milestone, it'll be conscious. Here's what's going to happen. Well, I will make a prediction on this. Maybe it's conscious. Maybe it's not conscious. That's up in the eye of the beholder. But one day, you're using it, and it's fine. And the next day, we all decide it's conscious, and it's still doing it the same way it was yesterday. It's not going to change. It's not going to matter. And the real reason we're interested in this question is twofold. First of all, can something other than biological beings be conscious? But the second reason we're interested is if something is conscious, and if we think it can experience things, then we, we, we wonder whether we have any moral obligation to it. That's really why people ask this question. And how many TV shows and movies have we seen where the robot suddenly wakes up and goes, wait a minute, I'm being exploited here. <laughs> That's the, the primary plot. And the whole idea is, oh, they're, they're the conscious robots and they're the ones that just carry out orders. And they're, they're impossible to tell apart in the most modern of these, you know, except they know the difference or something. So my, my point is that they're not going to wake up. There is no, nothing to wake up. And if we all decide it's conscious, you know, good for us. But I don't think it has any practical effect. And at least with the current technology, there's no way really to project this out to, to the point where we say, I'm, I'm worried because I'm hurting the computer's feelings. So I'm stepping on its toe or I'm offending it or anything like that. 
Let me just end by citing Hubert Dreyfus, who was a Berkeley philosopher in the 60s, who really irritated the then uh, very optimistic AI field by saying that um, he, he equated the rapid progress that the field was making at that point to a monkey who climbed to the top of the tree and decreed that he was making great progress on the way to the moon. <laughs> we may be there, we may not. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for, for your time this evening. Um, we do have a small gift for you. Um, Fair trade treats. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> and uh, also, I'd like to uh, thank Alice Iris, who was the one 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 who was the